afternoon, everybody. I'm Betsy Peck Learned. I'm the interim dean of the library here. Some of you have heard my spiel before, so I apologize for that. But um, I wanted to welcome you to our uh, first spring semester talking in the library series here and featuring um, Derek and Edith. And um, Adam Braver, our writer in residence, is going to introduce him. But I just had a couple things to talk to you about today. One is um, I wanted to mention the other two talking in the library events that are coming up. One is um, the fiction writer Greg Jackson, and he'll be here on March 29th. And um, on April 11th, Claire Masood will be here. She'll be leading the Vermont Fellowship Workshop for um, some of our creative writing students. Um, well, they're not just creative writing students, but students that have applied for the fellowship. And um, she will be speaking on April 11th at Rogers Free Library. We're trying to um, get some collaborative events going with the Rogers Free. So keep those in mind, and you'll be seeing posters and all kinds of um, advertisements about those. So today we're meeting in this um, Mary Teft White Center's new instant theater. And uh, Mary Teft, or Happy White as she was fondly known, was um, an alum, alumna of the university. She um, earned her degree degree very late in life, I think she was in her 70s, and um, she visited the campus often. And it was her generous endowed gift that allowed us to create the original Mary Teft White Cultural Center, which was this whole area without the glass walls and the fancy furniture, um, a decade ago. And um, her hope was that this series would introduce students to um, professionals and faculty and accomplished individuals who could share their professional and personal goals um, so that they would inspire and motivate students to um, pursue their careers. Um, and we are also grateful to her son, John Hazen White Jr., who was here this fall. Um, he spoke in, I think he was the first speaker in our series in the fall. Um, he is continuing his mother's legacy um, through supporting the transformation of this room. So he donated funds in order for us to be able to create a really high-tech space here. And um, there is abundant technology. You can just see the displays around the room, but this is really kind of a state-of-the-art room. And it can transform. The reason it's called instant theater is it can transform from a presentation space to like this to a student collaborative space. And if you come here during the day, you will see lots and lots of students studying in this room. It's a little warm today, but um, normally it's a nice space to work in. We think we need a mural, though. What do you say? Yeah. Okay. When, especially when the screen isn't down, it's pretty bland. So, so I'd like to introduce um, Adam Braver. He's going to introduce Derek. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for coming out. It's uh, especially on a kind of icky day. I know some of you are out here with you know guns in your backs and stuff. But either either way, glad you came out. Um, so. Um, and I also want to add the Greg Jackson, um, that Kevin Marchand has a lot riding on Greg Jackson being here, so, so you guys have to make sure you put that on your calendar. And, uh, I'm sure Kevin doesn't have egg on his face. Um, in, in my field, meaning the arts, almost inevitably the question of what makes something literary or serious writing versus popular writing. Uh, of the, um, almost inevitably the question of what makes something literary or serious writing versus popular writing and vice versa um, always comes up. When I teach summer workshops, rarely is there a time when the issue isn't raised. To some, the answer comes in a distinction between the character-driven work versus the plot-centered book. For others, the difference lies in genre. Each would be a perfectly fine answer, I suppose, if expedience was an issue and a simplified answer was all that anyone had time for. If only it were that easy. If only the great detective writer Dashiell Hammett or the legendary pulp writer Jim Thompson didn't write works that were every bit as literary as contemporaries such as Fitzgerald and Nathaniel West. And if only television, the ultimate lower form, didn't in fact have some of the most artful and innovative writing currently seen on any screen. And then, of course, <clears throat> there is an, the addition of YA to the conversation. Literature, or literature in that kind of way um, for young adults. Perhaps the answer to all these questions lies somewhere in the notion of the artful, 
that is how a work is constructed and approached from an artful position in terms of notions of structure, language, depth of character, intent, metaphor, etc. My experience in working with students interested in genre writing is that even when their resolve remains steadfast about their particular genre, thinking about it as a piece of art rather than just a story almost always makes it better. I'm really glad we have Derek Nikitas here today to, among other things, hear him help us parse out these distinctions. And I can't think of a better person to bring into this conversation. Putting aside for the moment his MFA in fiction and his PhD in English, and his professorship at URI, um, we will look to Derek the writer. Derek's first two books, The Edgar Nominated Pyres and The Long Division, um, and then the second book, The Long Division, were quote, adult thrillers, while his most recent, Extra Life, is a YA sci-fi thriller. There are also allegedly some zombie stories out there too. Derek is someone who sees and understands the artful, yet also will speak of the liberation that so-called genre writing allows. He is someone who has brought, who has thought considerably about the relationship of the forms, both as a scholar and a writer. And Derek is someone who can contribute perspective to this ongoing discussion. So, Derek Nikitas. Okay, can you hear me all right? Hopefully my voice will, oh, that's good. That's much better. <laughs> Hopefully my voice will hold up. I'm on the uh, tail end of a, of a cold here and a little concerned about it, but I, I think I'll be okay. First, I'd like to thank the Dean of the Library and Adam Braver for uh, inviting me here today. I'm really excited to be part of this conversation. When I talked to Adam about what, um, what I should do for this, he did mention uh, some of the things that he, that he talked about in his introduction just a minute ago, and the idea that many of you might be interested in dealing with or thinking about the distinctions between popular fiction, uh, literary fiction, young adult fiction, and all those things in between. Um, I'm not sure that at the end of it all, I'll be able to clarify anything <laughs> for anybody, uh, because these things continue to be um, questions that I ask myself a lot. And, and, but they do, they do keep my process of writing interesting to me and, uh, and exciting to, to be thinking about with each new project what um, what different approaches I can take and how I can keep changing what I'm doing. One of the most common pieces of advice that I hear from, um, from other writers has to do with this notion of finding your voice. Have you heard this before? You know, it's, it's so important for the, for the young writer to, uh, to find his or her voice. And I've always thought that that was an odd thing to say because um, I haven't. You know, I've, I've been, I've been act working at this for you know, since I was a teenager and I still haven't found a voice, I'm just interested in using different voices from time to time uh, in each subsequent story or each subsequent novel. And so I've always, you know, there are certainly authors who, who have a distinctive voice and you see it over and over again in, in all of their work and that can be really interesting. But um, at the same time, there are other authors. I think of uh, folks like uh, Michael Chabon or uh, Juliana Baggett, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, um, Jonathan Lethem, who keep changing what they do from, uh, from novel to novel and keep negotiating the boundary lines between what's considered art or literary fiction and what's considered uh, popular fiction, or whatever you want to call it. So I figured that's what I'd talk about today and I'd do it by way of giving you a little bit of a background in my own experience as a writer and my own negotiation of, uh, of this question. So uh, as as Adam mentioned a minute ago, I got my MFA in creative writing back in 2000 at the Univers University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And so I went through a year, three year program that was very much focused on teaching me how to be a literary writer. And that means specifically teaching me how to be the kind of writer who would be published in, uh, who would be able to publish short stories in literary magazines university literary magazines or small presses and things like that. Um, and, and I, you know, embraced it almost entirely. I did have the, um, 
the pleasure of having a couple of classes with some different kinds of visiting writers who had a somewhat different approach to what I just mentioned that um, gave me a, a different perspective, especially because I think, like a lot of people, I made my way into, I, I was a very early uh, writer. I was very interested in writing even before I was 10 years old. And uh, the models that I had at that time were things that um, would have been interested to a kid growing up in the 80s. So there was a you know fantasy. You know, the YA, as we, as we think of it now, didn't really exist. You know, you had uh, A Wrinkle in Time and things like that, stuff that the schools would assign to you but nothing that seemed uh, marketed directly toward kids. And so most of my reading material was, you know, Dean Koontz and Stephen King and Anne Rice. It's a little older than 10. My, my parents wouldn't let me read that stuff until I was a teenager. But, and, and, you know, big fat fantasy novels by Terry Brooks and Tolkien and, and stuff like that. So I came into um, creative writing as a genre or fiction writing as a genre from that perspective. And it took me a couple of semesters to embrace the idea of working on the sentence level, you know, the artistry of the sentence, the artistry of, uh, of the character and interiority. And all of those things became especially important to me. And I, I tended to brace, embrace writers who uh, kind of skirted the line between the two. Like, uh, I remember being pretty obsessed with John Irving for a while. He seems to write the same book over and over again these days, so I'm, I'm a little less interested in him, but um, he was one who had sort of a popular appeal at the same time that he, he, took his, he took his art very seriously. And it wasn't until after I graduated with my MFA that I, and, and I was on my own, that sort of terrifying period of time soon after the MFA when you no longer have workshops with peer students you know, for example, I remember specifically, he's still, a, this, this fellow writer is still a good friend of mine, so I, I don't mean any ill will toward him at all, but I remember submitting a story for workshop in which there was a gun. And his comment in workshop was, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of cheesy to have a gun in a story at all. It doesn't even get fired. It's just the idea of doing that made it pushed it into the seedy realm of, uh, of, of genre fiction. And, and I thought that was a pretty odd comment, but that was kind of the uh, exemplary of the world that I was, that I was in. And so when I graduated, I, I kind of had to think about how I wanted to negotiate this myself. And I published a, a number of short stories in your traditional uh, literary magazines, but I also was having a lot of trouble with it. You know, I, 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 I totally embraced the idea that you have to keep submitting things over and over again, and I compiled my massive rejection letters that all my, my, all my professors told me that I would have to compile before I started thinking that I was a real writer, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it still seemed to take, you know, 20, 25 different times sending one story out to different magazines and, and getting nothing but form rejections until I started submitting to uh, magazines that were considered more obviously genre magazines, especially Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this thing, but it's, um, you know, it shows up in, uh, in Barnes, I would say Borders and Barnes and Noble, but they don't have Borders anymore. So, you know, it's, it's in Barnes and Noble and, and, uh, and some other grocery stores, I suppose, from time to time. And it's a very old fashioned, Alfred Hitchcock and Ellery Queen, they're, they're two like old fashioned mystery magazines. Um, and I thought I didn't really have much of a chance there either because I wasn't writing old-fashioned Alfred Hitchcock kind of stories. But I submitted one story to them and they accepted it within a week. And then I submitted a second one and they accepted it within a couple of days. And then I started thinking, what's going on here? I mean, something is, something is off. And it wasn't that, it wasn't that Ellery Queen was, uh, you know, some kind of low-rent venue. It was, it was very popular and very widely known and, and still is. Um, and so that started to clue me in to the notion, I was pretty thick about it for a while, to clue me into the notion that maybe I wasn't the kind of writer that my MFA program was expecting me to be and it kind of groomed me to be. Um, then I started, because I was getting interest from agents, one of the things I learned along the way is, you know, if you publish stories in, in high profile literary magazines, sometimes the agents will come to you which happened a lot of times. They'd always come to me and then I'd send them something and they'd say, yeah, actually on second thought, forget it. Um, so that happened a lot. But I did eventually find, uh, find an agent 
with my short stories, and he started helping me out with uh, his, his, as any agent that I've ever heard from will tell you, um, you know, once they get a hold of you, they're, they sort of say, enough with this short story stuff, let's, let's get a novel going here. Um, and that's what I did. So after about f three or four years out of my MFA, I started working on novels and, you know, started a lot of them and would get feedback from my agent at the time telling me various things, most of which had to do with the marketability of the book because I happened to choose an agent who was interested in, um, you know, selling to a major New York press instead of um, press it, small presses who'd be less interested in marketability and more interested in artistry. Um, and, you know, to me, uh, growing up on Stephen King and Dean Koontz and all of that other kind of stuff, I was still, I still wanted to, you know, have, I still wanted to work in genre and I still want, had that, wanted to have that, that kind of wider appeal, I suppose. Um, so eventually, I put together, finished a draft of this novel, Pyres, which is, which does something that I've always been really fascinated with, not just writing in a genre, but um, blending genres, bringing genres together. I think of um, Game of Thrones, for example, which takes a fairly classic um, fantasy, medieval kingdom kind of, um, kind of idea and, and combines it with a political thriller. So that it has all of the tropes of a political thriller at the same time that it has all of the tropes of fantasy. And it's through that combination, through bringing, it's, it's basically like fusion in restaurants, right? Like bringing Italian and Korean food together, suddenly you have some new and interesting thing. Uh, and so I, I love the idea of, of that kind of fusion. You know, going all the way back to Star Wars, which is, you know, uh, People call it science fiction, but it's not. It's a you know, it's a fantasy mixed with um, a western, mixed with uh, Japanese. What the, what do they call them? Like samurai stories, basically, and a bunch of other things. But I think those are the three prominent ones. And of course, Star Wars was hailed as something very original when it first came out. Um, but really what it was was a combination of things. And so I was interested in doing that. So I took a fairly straightforward um, mystery, whodunit, you know, there's a murder and somebody has to figure out who did it and put it together with a, a fantasy story that was kind of bringing in these magical realist elements of Norse mythology and all that other kind of stuff. And, you know, people thought it was crazy for doing that sort of thing. The agent that I had said, this is, you know, for like the fifth time said, this is completely unmarketable. No one will buy this. Um, and so I dropped the agent, or we sort of mutually agreed that it just wasn't going to work out because I couldn't, I couldn't reach that level of uh, writing something that's just absolutely popular fiction for him. So um, then I worked on the novel a little bit longer. I got another call from an editor at um, St. Martin's Press who said, I really enjoyed your story in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. Do you have a novel? And uh, by the way, the, uh, I've been, I was taught this uh, in my MFA program by a, by a professor who was um, mainly worked in the, in the business from a uh, publishing background more than a, than a writing background. He had a, a sort of weird storied history. He was Jack Kerouac's agent and also uh, a producer for Fraggle Rock later on, so that's how varied his resume was. Um, but one of the things that I remember distinctly him saying is if an editor calls you up and says, do you have a novel, the answer is yes. And then when you hang up, you hurry up and finish it or start writing it. Uh, you don't say no. You know. So uh, luckily I was pretty far along the way, but I wasn't finished yet, so I said, yeah, I have a novel. And uh, he, you know, after a couple of months, I finished it up and sent it to him, and he wanted it. So. Uh, I had to find an, this is backwards, this isn't how it's supposed to work at all. You're supposed to get an agent first and then um, the agent shops the story around and, or the novel around and gets it, uh, finds a publisher for you, hopefully. Um, but in this instance, um, it went the other way around. I found an editor first and then I needed an agent to broker the deal, so to speak. And, uh, and that's what I did, I got a, a two book deal with a, um, a press that uh, in St. Martin's called Minotaur, which is specifically geared toward um, the mystery and crime noir genre. They publish a lot of books in, in crime noir and things like that. 
And, uh, and so the book came out as a, as a crime noir book, and I still hadn't, hadn't hit me entirely that that's what my genre was, nor had it hit me that the expectation would be that the second book would be um, also in the crime noir genre. Because this is a thing that happens, you know, you, you publish a book in a certain genre, and if it does okay, which this one did, because it, did, it, it had the, uh, I was really lucky to get nominated for an Edgar Award, which is the, the big prize in, in mystery writing in the United States. And, and so there was a, a certain degree of exposure because of that. And that made it, that sort of pushed me into that position. Um, at a much, much smaller level than what Stephen King did in, in early on in his career, but if you read about his first couple of books, he talks about the same thing. After Carrie was published and did so well, many, many, many times better than mine did, um, did so well, then, he's, then he got a lot of pressure to, uh, he didn't consider himself a horror novelist, he just um, considered himself a writer. But he started to get a lot of pressure to submit horror novels. He had actually two novels uh, ready to go after Carrie, and, uh, and his agent told him to go with Salem's Lot. And that kind of sealed his fate, so to speak. From time to time, he does publish things that are not horror, but for the most part, he sticks with it. Um, so once the second novel came out, something interesting happened, which was that it, uh, it didn't do very well. It was, uh, it was, I guess, much more conventional, a, a crime thriller. I was doing some th weird things, uh, some kind of experimental things with the structure that uh, didn't quite hit exactly right. And so when my, uh, when my deal with St. Martin's was over, I was uh, you know, thinking about doing various things, none of which were really following it up with yet another crime novel, because I didn't feel like, uh, I felt like I was kind of done with it. I felt like I'd said what I wanted to say and, uh, and didn't want to go there again. And that, uh, that period was especially strange, and uh, I kept having a lot of false starts, kind of thinking about what I was going to do. Sometimes I thought that I would just try to write another crime novel and see what would happen. Um, but at other times, I'd have these other ideas because uh, I was much more interested in, dealing, in, in messing around with genre. Uh, I'd have you know, fantasy ideas and science fiction ideas. There was, a, there was an, uh, back in 2008, I had an idea for a zombie novel. And I actually started writing it. And I sent, it, I sent the first 50 pages to St. Martin's. And they were like, remember, this was 2008. They were like, well, it's good. But zombies, I don't know. It's sort of way old fashioned, isn't it? So. I was like, okay, fine. I, I excised part of it for a short story that appeared in a um, zombie anthology, um, but I never went back to the book. And now, you know, now it's like it's too late. So I was a little, I was a little bit ahead of the curve on that one, and, and should have stuck to my guns, I guess, and, and seen what happened. So eventually, it came around. I came around to the idea of uh, of writing a young adult novel, partly. Um, Partly for commercial reasons. Partly, I, I wanted to see if I could really write uh, a novel that was um, that was geared toward a specific audience that um, had a mass appeal, and to see if I could actually do it. Because I was actually doubting that um, that I could do this thing that my first agent uh, kept telling me that that I couldn't. There was always that that itch to get it right. At the end of it all, I'm not even sure if I did get it right or not, but uh, you know, I tried. So I had this idea. I've had this idea floating around for a long time about um, this very specific kind of time travel situation, which is more like um, it, it's more like Groundhog Day, you know, where it's one day and you keep the the character keeps going back in time. So it would be um, kind of structurally interesting because the characters would keep going through the same time period with um, added, with things changed and so forth. So it was a little odd structurally. And I don't remember exactly the moment when I decided that this novel should be a young adult novel, other than this feeling that I had. I tend to get ideas, plot ideas first, and then decide um, what kind of character would, would best fit into that plot idea. And for years, I'd had ideas about putting uh, an adult character into this situation. And it just wasn't working until I decided to put a young adult, a 16-year-old, into the situation. And then suddenly, the idea of a, like a control freak 16-year-old um, who wants to you know, be a filmmaker and all this other stuff kind of just gelled together with this idea. 
And so I was able to bring the character together with the, um, with the, the story idea itself and, uh, and put together this YA thing. So having absolutely no experience in YA, other than having a lot of students over the years, I used to teach novel writing courses when I, I taught at Eastern Kentucky University for a while. You know, I had like three novel writing courses, and invariably most of my uh, students, or at least 50% of my students wanted to write young adult novels. And I felt ill at ease advising them on how to write young adult novels because uh, I was not a writer of young adult novels and I knew very little about it. So I sought to fill that gap in my experience and, and see what I could figure out. What I discovered was, you know, I, you know, I did the research to, to find out what constitutes a young adult novel, what makes it different from a, you know, an adult novel, and, and, and I read a good number of, of young adult novels. The most popular ones, I guess this is probably true in all cases, but the most, very, the, the most absolutely popular ones, like Twilight uh, and Hunger Games, I found awful. Um, Hunger, you know, Twilight is just, is just unbearable, but uh, Hunger Games is a little bit better um, but the character is so bland and uninteresting that I just couldn't get into it at all. And then I had a friend who'd read all three of them, and I said, you know, I got through the first one. Is there, should I read the next two? He said, no, no, all she does is fall unconscious a lot, and then all of the interesting thing happens while she's unconscious, and then she wakes up and it already happened. So it's really not that interesting. So, um, but I did, uh, I did begin to find uh, young adult writers that were, were very interesting to me. The one exception, I think, to hugely popular um, being terrible is, is John Green. I think, I think John Green's work is, uh, is, is both popular and pretty darn good for, um, especially with Fault in Our Stars and Looking for Alaska. And so um, reading John Green was, uh, was really sort of an eye-opener to see that, yes, you can, you can kind of have it both ways. You can write something that, that, that is artistically fulfilling to you at the same time as, uh, as angling a story toward uh, a certain kind of... Um, audience. But of course, John Green writes um, realism. And uh, my interest was in science fiction. So there was a few other authors like, uh, like uh, Joe, Joel Schreiber, Joe Schreiber, who wrote um, this little book called Au Revoir, Crazy European Chick, which seems ridiculous. But I, I read it, and uh, it was this sort of fast-paced thriller novel that um, really opened my eyes to um, how to how to structure a novel like the the kind of novel that I was interested in. So I want to stop here for a second and make this a little bit more collaborative because I've been talking for too long and uh, and ask you the same question I asked myself when I sat down to write this book: What makes a young adult novel? What is it? What is a young adult novel that a that an adult novel isn't, or vice versa? I suppose. How many of you are are you're taking creative writing classes, interested in, okay. So a good number of you. Is it a question you've asked yourself before? No? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, what I find interesting about young adult um, fiction is that it's not something that I've come to really recognize until very recently. So you know, like John Green and Hunger Games, you know, like when everyone else is reading them, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, and so that, that seems to be the, f the first and most obvious um, area that you'd, that you'd inquire about is, uh, you know, the age of the protagonist. And I think one of the very few things that we can say for sure about young adult novels is that the protagonist probably needs to be a teenager. Um, the, I, I'm not familiar with too many young adult novels that would be about adults or have an adult protagonist. Um, but then obviously, as you, as you insinuated or, or said outright, there are a lot of novels for adults that have teenager protagonists uh, or young protagonists. To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, you know. And so the, the question becomes, even if you have a, 
a, a young person as the protagonist, what other qualities have to be in place for it to be considered a young adult novel? Yeah. Do you think the protagonist presents quite a predominance of leadership, like even if he doesn't play under a young adult? Um, it has to be kind of like palatable for young people to be able to read it and understand. Yeah, yeah, palatable. That's a good word. I like it. Um, I did read a lot about exactly exactly what constitutes a palatable and, uh, and, and where you should be on that line. And then you start thinking about, you know, what kind of compromises do I have to make as a writer to, um, to angle this novel or this story toward a young adult? And in one respect, you might, you might consider that selling out or pandering or whatever. Um, but it's not that much different from the very same thing that we do to ourselves, no matter what kind of piece of writing we're doing. We create boundaries for ourselves in, in all of our writing. We decide to write in a certain point of view, for example, or we decide to write in a certain time period. So we are always creating these, um, you know, I don't think very many of us ever come to a piece of fiction with absolute uh, open-mindedness, you know. We, we're always giving some boundaries to ourselves about this. So this boundary, the boundary of palatability, was, uh, was perhaps something slightly imposed from the outside, but at the same time I saw it as, as a kind of challenge. So I guess the next question becomes, what, what do we mean by palatable? and what, what makes some novels palatable for young adults and, and some not? I guess there are some dark themes in uh, the most popular uh, YA books. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure uh, they, they end up in you know, tragedy and tragedy here so much. You still, uh, because you think that you want this. Yeah, I actually sp spent a lot of time thinking about that as well, and I noticed something very interesting. My presupposition, uh, my presupposition was very much like yours, that if it was going to be young adult fiction, I, so the first two novels that I wrote were, were frankly really dark. They were, they were crime noir. Um, I, I just, you know, from time to time I still get reviews on Goodreads and stuff, and the last one. The last one that I got was in French, so I ran it through, I don't know French, so I ran it through Google Translate. And at the very end, it says that Nikitas um, removed, removed a piece of my heart by the end of the story. And it was a good review, but, uh, and I thought, man, I, is that a mistranslation or, <laughs> or, or what? But, uh, you know, so there's this, so my experience and, and some of the things that have been said about my work is that it is, in, it is incredibly uh, dark, especially the second novel is very downbeat. And so I thought, if I'm going to write a young adult novel, then I really need to make sure that uh, I do something a little bit more upbeat and life-affirming. Uh, and I ended up doing that. I mean, the, the novel that I did write is far more, you know, it still has dark themes, but it's far more upbeat and life-affirming. So I did do that. However, one thing that I did discover is that my presupposition about young adult novels was just not the case. There are some really dark, depressing young adult novels. There are a lot of dark, depressing young adult novels with very little life-affirming qualities to them. And I think the distinction is between what we now consider, you know, you can go back into the 80s and mid-90s and, and all the way back to the 60s and find novels that are considered, um, you know, Judy Bloom and, uh, and Madeline, uh, I don't even know how you pronounce her French last name, or Lengel, or Lengel. Um, you know, folks like that, you can go back and find those and nowadays, those novels would, would definitely be considered young adult. But the young adult market, up until about the turn of the century, 
just maybe a little bit before the turn of the century, was filtered through the schools. So the books that would reach the hands of young adults were books that were kind of sanctioned by, by the schools and, 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 and vetted so that they did have life-affirming qualities and often were connected to some, like Johnny Tremaine or something, you know, often connected to some kind of historical event. And so they were very much connected with the schools. But so, I don't, you know, I haven't done enough research to know exactly what happened here, but sometime around Twilight and so forth, the um, publishers started marketing directly to young adults rather than through the schools. And so that barrier of vetting work um, and making sure that it has life-affirming qualities and making sure that it has some degree of quality at all um, kind of fell away and it became more about what do teenagers want. And what teenagers want a lot of times is really dark and depressing stuff. Like one of the most popular um, books of the last uh, 10 years or so was Jay Asher's 13 Reasons Why, which is a series of cassette tapes that a girl who commits suicide leaves to her friend to explain why she killed herself. So it's a 250 page novel that's just a long explanation of why this girl killed herself because of all the horrible things that she went through. Not exactly, I mean, maybe there's an uplifting ending, I don't remember, but not exactly a life affirming situation. So I was surprised to discover that um, some suppositions I had about, uh, about content were, were really no longer true, which was freeing, but also um, surprising. You had your hand. Yeah, it's no surprise that we have so many of these young adult novels about totalitarian governments. The, uh, you know, the, the analog for parents is just so painfully obvious. Um, but, you know, at, at, the t at the same time, there are these reoccurring themes that I think we need to, uh, we need to think about and address uh, if, if we're looking at young adult. There, there, you know, you always have to be careful about how you say this because there's always exceptions, but there's a more limited scope, I suppose areas of interest for, for young adults, and so you are confined uh, a little bit in that regard. You can usually find, you can usually find metaphors like totalitarian governments, for example, to get at what, um, what you're trying to address with young people. Um, other, other ideas that you have about, yeah? I think that young people feel like they don't have very much control, so in young adult novels, it seems like something always happens to them. They might not go out seeking for a change or something, but it comes to them, and it might like result in them gaining more power on their own once this thing happens to them, but they never had control of the first thing in the beginning. Yeah, that's interesting. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does, like uh, the agency of the, of the protagonist. I guess like if you think of Harry Potter, he doesn't go out seeking for the letter to Hogwarts. It just like shows up. So you mentioned Harry Potter, which, which causes me to pause and perhaps make a, a further distinction. Because um, when we talk, one of the things I learned very quickly is when we talk about, I have a colleague at URI who talks about my children's book. And every time he does, I'm like, what a children's book, exactly. But he can't, he, he can't get there somehow. Um, but there are just, you know, there are children's books there are middle grade books, which I think is what Harry Potter is. And middle grade is a specific genre. Then there's young adult. And more recently, there's been this tentative nod toward what they're trying to do, a new genre called new adult. Have any of you heard about this? It's very much like, I mean, most of it's about, it's very much like young adult, but it's usually, um, you know, undergraduates, you know, college age people. Usually very realistic fiction. You're not going to find a lot of you know, horror or science fiction or anything like that in new adult, usually pretty sexy. Like, that's the difference. That's the thing that makes it not a young adult novel, but a, uh, a new adult novel. 
But from what I have been able to see, it doesn't seem to have really taken off. I think because perhaps you guys, you college students, have a lot of other reading that you have to do. And so maybe new adult isn't catching on like they expected it to. But there are further distinctions between middle grade and, uh, and young adult that, uh, that we oftentimes have to, um, have to address. One of them being, I think, that middle grade still very much is vetted through schools and through um, publishing companies like the Scholastic, who do pay mind to the, um, to the thematic issues and, and whether or not uh, they're life affirming and, and uplifting, et cetera. And of course, the protagonist is gonna be a little bit younger and the reading is gonna be a little easier. Other observations? Yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. um, it, it goes toward this and you mentioned To Kill a Mockingbird think of books like A Separate Piece or Catcher in the Rye that had the category young adult exist at the time. They were, for marketing purposes, maybe gone straight there. Yeah. I wonder, are there any authors, maybe Green or others you might think of, who are, who are almost being denied a broader readership because the marketing mechanism drives them toward young adult because of their young protagonists and the kind of life situations? I, I just wonder if that category is almost too restricted for some. I don't think so, and and part of the reason is that when you actually look at the sales records, um, most read most people who buy young adult fiction are adults. About sixty percent of the of the of the purchasers of, of young adult fiction are, are are grown people in their thirties or older, and so there really isn't that um, that boundary line where you would think you know if if John Green were only marketed to adults and adults would buy his books and adults do very regularly buy his books in larger quantities than, um, than young adults do. I think the reverse is probably more true, that uh, an author, I have a, a, an author friend, uh, Megan Abbott, who writes these, um, these crime thriller novels about, uh, her last few have been uh, about young women in high school in these, in these bizarre sort of contexts. So one is called Dare Me, which is about, uh, she calls it like cheerleading meets fight club. So it's about the cutthroat world of, the very dark and cutthroat world of high school cheerleading and when there's, um, you know, with uh, body dysmorphia and injury and, and all this other, and, and peer pressure and all this other stuff that happens. It was, it, it did very well, but it was marketed to an adult audience. And I don't know that, um, I don't know that it would have done even better if it had been marketed to young adults as well. Um, I don't have a clear answer for you, but certainly I do think that um, Young adult has not, for the most part, been an impediment to getting a, a, adults to, to buy books. In fact, adults who, there are a lot of folks who um, are not necessarily readers. Uh, Lee Child, the, uh, the thriller writer Lee Child, published something in The Guardian la last week about this, about the fact that um, uh, Amazon is creating brick and mortar stores and he published a, a, a piece about that, but an ancillary issue was um, how, how many people actually go on Amazon to seek out a book um, digitally, you know, virtually, versus people who are impulse buyers at grocery stores. And the vast majority of books get bought on impulse at grocery stores and, and uh, Target and Walmart and things like that. They don't actually get mostly bought at, uh, on Amazon because most people don't go on Amazon and find books that they want, you know, like seek out books that they've heard about. They usually just stick with the authors that they know and they, oh, that person has a, you know, James Patterson has a new book out, I'll buy it today. I didn't even know. Uh, that probably seems weird to most of us because we live in this little bubble of people who go on Amazon or wherever, you know, go into uh, independent bookstores and seek out books that we want to read. Um, but that's sort of the majority of people. And so um, a lot of the authors who, who uh, do well are, are young adult authors who, um, who are in that kind of category, whose, whose books get picked up at the, at the grocery store and so forth. I forget where I was going with that, but it's an interesting piece of information anyway. Well, here's a couple of other things that I noticed along the way. Um, what was the word that you used? Palatable, yeah. Um, 
I, te I, I picked up this word from, a, from an essay that I read, which was impatience. I think it's a nicely neutral word for the most part to describe um, certain things. So there's a couple of things I think that readers of young adult novels, whether they're adults or not, are, are slightly impatient about. One of those things is extended passages of interiority or going into the character's head for a long, long period of time. That's more, um, more what you'd find in uh, adult novels or literary novels. And so one of the restrictions that I knew that I had going from writing adult novels to young adult was being more conscientious about the economy of the interiority that I use. This was the first novel that I wrote in first person, but um, which, which lends itself even more to interiority in some ways. But I had to be careful about exactly how much um, I included because I knew that this story, you know, interiority um, has many important qualities, but one of the things that it does is it tends to slow down the, uh, the forward momentum of the novel. So um, that's one of the reasons. The other thing that um, it is said that young adults have a little bit of impatience for is um, poetic language, right, or lyrical language. The kind of thing that takes a little bit longer to, um, to understand, perhaps, or to parse out all the meanings of if you're reading. You know, you can spend uh, 20 minutes on a Melville sentence if you want, but that Melville wouldn't be a good writer of, <laughs> of young adult fiction, maybe. Um, so I had to think about that as well. That was really the toughest one for me because I had grown up, or I had been through the MFA program, and become very um, attached to lyrical writing and, and beauty on the sentence level. And so to, um, to be hamstrung a little bit in that regard was, uh, was tough at first. But once I got used to the, one of the things about putting it in first person was that I had to be bound to the way that a 16-year-old would express himself. Um, and so that helped me get over that hump a little bit, that some of the things, if, if I wrote too lyrical a sentence, it would be showing off. It would be the author showing off, and, uh, and it wouldn't be true to the character. And therefore, um, I would have a good reason to, to revise it and rethink what I was doing. The other thing that I'd say, the other two things have to do with um, the narrative perspective, one of which is uh, an almost total lack of retrospective. Have you talked about this at all in your uh, creative writing courses, retrospection? The idea that especially when you have a first-person narrator, or even in third-person sometimes, um, the character may be, the character who's going through the actions in the story is much younger than the character who's telling the story. If there's a great degree of retrospection. Almost all stories have a little bit of a degree of retrospection because there's always some distance between when the story is being told and when the, when the events of the story happen. There's some span of time. But young adult novels are impatient about extended degrees of retrospection. They want the narrator to be, still be a teenager. So probably the most retrospection you can have is, is a year or two, right? If you go any further into that, you start writing a story from a, an adult perspective, looking back on the childhood, then, it, then you have that issue of um, how well can a, a young adult writer, uh, reader, excuse me, connect to a character like that has a great degree of retrospection. So that was difficult. Um, that's why a lot of young adult novels are in present tense. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's a weird device because it makes no sense whatsoever. I think The Hunger Games is in first person present tense, right? It, so it, if you think about it, it presupposes that Katniss is um, telling this story at the moment that it is happening to her while she's trying to like, defend herself from being killed by other teenagers on the battlefield doesn't make any sense. Um, she would have to have told the story after the fact in, in retrospective. So there's a bit of a, I mean, we're used to it because it's a convention that we accept, but it's weird when you think about it. So there does have to be certain retrospective, even if it's in first person. It's a, it's a bit of a cheat. Um, but putting it in present tense is a way of signaling that you're really not um, considering retrospective at all. And then the last one is sort of connected, but it has to do with nostalgia. and. Um, so Ernest Klein published a novel a couple of years ago that was very, very popular called Ready Player One. And it was, a, you know, it was mostly a, a pop culture novel with a slightly um, post-apocalyptic uh, elements to it. And the protagonist was a young person, if I remember. 
And it was, uh, there wasn't a lot of interiority. It was very easy to read. Every sign pointed it to being marketed as a, a young adult novel, as far as I could see. But the one thing that made it different is that the main character's whole story arc has to do with being nostalgic about all of these things from the 80s, like Back to the Future and uh, early Atari video games and all this other kind of stuff. Um, story elements that would, uh, that would really not be uh, of interest to most uh, young adult readers. And so that was the one that that nostalgic sense or looking back to an earlier period of time was the one element, I think, that made a difference for Ready Player One. It did a great, you know, it, it did very, very well, regardless of how it was marketed. Um, but it was one case where I think that that one extra element of nostalgia made all the difference. That doesn't mean that you can't write a young adult novel uh, that's a period piece. Um, there have been a number of successful YA period pieces from, you know, uh, like Libba Bray's The Diviners, which I think takes place in the, in the 30s or, or even earlier than that. I don't remember exactly when. Um, and that's okay as long as the, the author does all the work to situate the reader into the, the time period and, and makes a real effort to show the young adult reader that young adults in the 1930s were dealing with the same sort of issues that you are now, and, uh, and there's really no difference. It's not, it's not nostalgia so much as it is bringing the, the reader into, um, into that time period. So that was, um, that was it. And those were the elements that I thought about. Those were my kind of guiding principles for, for writing the book. And, uh, and this is, you know, this is what came out of it. Um, and that's my spiel, so to speak. I don't know. I suppose I should open it up to, to questions if we have time. Yeah, yeah. John Green has said a lot about this, because he gets slack sometimes for the way that his characters speak. They tell him, um, you know, reviewers will say, these people do not sound like they're, you know, 15, 16 years old. They sound like they're 35 with master's degrees. Um, and his, his perspective is always that, um, you know, we have to, one thing that we do have to accept, I think, is when you write a young adult novel, you're not marketing to all young adults. You're marketing to uh, you're marketing to adults once again, as I mentioned earlier. But you're also marketing to a specific subset of young adults who are readers, um, and so that presupposes a certain amount of, um, of, of intellect and, and interest and all of that kind of stuff. And so I tend to err toward um, John Green's perspective on things, which is that um, there's no reason to talk down to, aside from the issues of impatience that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Then in terms of dialogue or um, the complexity of, uh, of a character's emotional state or something like that. It's, it, there's no reason to talk down to a young adult audience and uh, most audiences will appreciate if it didn't seem like you were pandering to a, um, a less intellectual audience. Does that yeah. cover it? Yeah. I'll actually follow this question because I'm wondering also on another level, um, in terms of how edgy Yet, how much that's changing now in terms of the situations an author might write about, still not run up against that vetting process you mentioned yeah. earlier. Yeah. Um, one one of the first concerns I had, we didn't even get into this, was uh, was content. Like, uh, what what would if there were ratings for books, what would what would the book be rated? And much like I was surprised to discover that uh, that many young adult novels are pretty dark. I was also surprised to discover that many young adult novels are pretty racy. Uh, and pretty violent. The only thing that I can really see is, um, you know, they don't like you to swear a lot. In, in so you have to find ways to to get around that um, within reason. If, if it's ridiculous to, uh, I actually had an early reader who read one draft of this book who who saw me like bending over backwards to try to avoid having my character swear, and she was just like, "Come on, I mean, it's obvious that what this person means to say here, so just go ahead and say it." So 
most of the time, I didn't worry about it too, too much, um, mainly because I wasn't, you know, I didn't create characters who were going to swear all the time, but in really high intensity situations, maybe they would. But I have read passages in young adult novels that, um, that in terms of sexuality have made me blush, uh, and in terms of violence are just as crazy as a Quentin Tarantino movie. And so I think part of that, um, part of that shift from uh, marketing through schools and directly to young adult audiences has gotten rid of that, um, that boundary line in terms of content. So there's very little that I see that um, would, uh, would be restricted, which creates an issue, I think, for, um, for parents who don't, because movies and, and video games have rating systems, uh, and it's always, been, it's always been sort of the idea with books that you know, it's, it's mostly your imagination interacting with the story, so you can't, it can only be as bad as your imagination is. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it does create a situation where parents don't really have a clear sense necessarily of, uh, of what, uh, what are in some of these books, which is why you, you have these situations of banned books. Somebody, usually, in, you know, if somewhere in the Midwest or something, somebody will read their kid's book and discover, you know, oh my god, there's this passage in Road Trip to Alaska, and so we have to ban this book from the family. That, I think, is going a little too far. I think, you know, there probably does have to be some, some interaction between the, the kids and the parents about what's in the book, but um, not the community. So um, when, I'm, when I'm working on a project, I write every day. Um, I, I won't pretend that I write every day. Uh, in between, so, you know, maybe a couple months will go by in between projects. But when I do start a project, I think it's vitally, I'm not the first person to say this, but I think it's vitally important to, to write every day at the same time for the same period of time so that you train your brain to be prepared for that moment and, and not get, and for me, early in the morning when all of the, trials and tribulations of life have yet to seep into my consciousness is the, um, is the ideal time to do that because that's when the subconscious is most available. Um, and again, I, this, this, I'm just reiterating things that I've, I've heard a lot of other writers say that I firmly believe because they have, they have been true for me. So for the most part, I do write every day, especially when I'm writing the first draft of a project. It does get a little spottier once I start revising. Um, I'm a planner. Which is, was another thing that really set me apart from most of my MFA peers and professors. Most of the people that I talk to in academia, in, in literary writing, talk about you know the the um, the freeing way and the, the the process of discovery that happens when you um, just let the work take you wherever it wants to go. And I know I know that that must be true, and I absolutely believe that it is true for people. But for me, the end result is writer's block. Um, and so I pretty meticulously plan the, the work that I do. You know, ultimately, I think it's the same thing. I don't, we all at some point freely brainstorm our writing. It doesn't, you know, but for me, once it comes down to writing the story on a sentence by sentence level, I want that brainstorming to be done because I want to have my mind free to, to write the paragraphs and write the sentences. I want to know what I'm doing. But in the process of writing the outline, um, then I'm, I'm completely open-minded and free as to, as to where the story goes. But once that outline is solidified, um, I stick to it pretty well. That doesn't mean it doesn't change um, here and there in little bits and pieces, but for the most part, it, uh, I, I stick to it. It wasn't something that came to me. I, I didn't know, and I do this to my, I, I used to do this to my novel writing students. I'd, I'd make them plan By the end of the semester, they know the whole process is not to convince them that planning is the right thing to do. The whole process is to put them through it 
to see if they discover for themselves that it's the right thing to do, or if they discover for themselves that it's just the wrong thing to do for them. Uh, unfortunately, the ones who discover that it's the wrong thing to do have probably killed the project in the process. But um, at least then they know that, you know, I think it's important to try all the different strategies for writing. Um, and some of them, you know, they, they learn that they are planners and they swear by it. I think most people don't, um, don't try it until they're forced to. And then uh, the ones who, who take to it right away discover um, a, a much less laborious process. Uh, another thing I remember from my MFA program was how all my professors would talk about their, their 25 drafts. And I would just sit there, you know, it took me four years to write this short story. I just sit there thinking, I don't, you know, one life to live, man. I don't have time to, <laughs> I don't have time to write 25 drafts. So for me, one of the, one of the good things about planning ahead of time is that um, my first couple of drafts are that outline. And, uh, and it's obviously a much, much shorter draft of something than, than the full-fledged novel. And so when it comes time to revise the novel, I'm only looking at it again, you know, hopefully only like five or six more times.